Hey everybody, it's Final Flame Productions here, uh, and welcome to the first episode of the uh, Final Flame Productions podcast, or the Final Flame podcast. Uh, it's me, uh, Steve, from Final Flame, and we've got uh, JC for life um, with me as well. He's going to be my uh, co-host, and he's going to argue with me and tell me I'm a, an idiot, or agree with me and tell me I'm a really intelligent person. I don't think there's going to be a lot of that, though. Um, so I don't JC, think so. <laughs> <laughs> so JC, if you want to give a little quick intro, of what your channel is about? Yeah, I'll link your channel in the description as well. Your YouTube channel. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I uh, also play games on my channel. Uh, usually two to four days a week, I play PGA Two K Twenty One. Uh, the other two days a week, uh, I should say it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, I play Art of Rally on Wednesdays. Uh, live on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash JC for life. I haven't nailed down a consistent schedule there yet, but I do play a variety of stuff there. So if you're interested in gaming at all or just want to hang out, chill place to do so. Cool. Uh, well, this podcast is going to be uh, a little bit, a bit, a little bit of everything: uh, movies, gaming, wrestling, some other sports. Um, and hopefully the uh, podcast on YouTube, I can, I'm can i going to set out uh, the topics that you can skip on. And if you want to look at, if you want, if you want to look at uh, a certain topic, uh, there should be the option at the, on the timeline of the, uh, the video. Uh, but we're going to start off uh, with uh, Mortal Com- Kombat uh, 2021. The movie was released, uh, I believe it's been two or three weeks ago or something like, like that at this point. Um, give our discussions, uh, talk about the response it's got from fans and critics. Um, I'll start it off and generally say I, I love the movie. Uh, I'm actually not that, uh, I'm not that big, big of a fan of Mortal Kombat in the sense that uh, I wouldn't know uh, the ins and outs of everything. Like some people would be able to just rhyme off uh, character names, all the character names and what their special moves are and all that type of stuff. I'm more of a casual fan. I've obviously seen the old movie, uh, played some of the games. Uh, so I generally came into it just kind of hoping. I, I seen the trailer, thought the trailer looked terrific. Um, the movie was just a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we, we've had we've had games to movies that, you know, have been a disaster. We've had mediocre ones. Um, I personally... I've liked a few of those movies in the last few years, like Tomb Raider with Alicia Vikander, even the older Tomb Raider movies I thought were really good. I think there's a, maybe a little bit of, um, a little bit of, uh, what's the word? Uh, High expectations? Well, what I was going for is I think I think people are a little bit sm- what's this, snobby about video game movies. I think, I think people are pretty cons- Perception that they're going to be bad, and they 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 give them a lot more flack than they need. Um, but yeah, I loved it. Uh, what was your take on it, uh, JC? Did, how did how did you enjoy it? I thought it was quite fun. I really really enjoyed it. First things uh, I wanted to just say right off the bat, like maybe I think you're a little bit right that you know like people do have a reasonable. Like, it's reasonable for them to think that, you know, oh, it's probably going to be a bad movie. Because, like you said, there's a track record of game-to-movie adaptations being bad. So yeah. that's completely understandable. But at the same time, like, I, th- I think it's definitely worth giving this movie a chance. Because I think you hit the nail on the head whenever you said it yourself. And I'm if I find myself in the same boat myself, like, I'm not a super hardcore Mortal Kombat fan. I haven't really played much of them since the original trilogy. I did play, what was it, Mortal Kombat 9 when it came out? Okay. Which kind of of soft rebooted the franchise in a way that kind of is a little bit Terminator-y, but we're going to be talking about that later, so let's maybe not dip too far into that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think it it's definitely hit with a lot of fan service that I feel like it needed to hit. There, like, 
aside from maybe one or two characters, a lot of the, a lot of the cast were from the original trilogy trilogy of games. There was nods to other people yeah. in the move in the Mortal Kombat universe who didn't appear in this movie. So maybe they might appear in a possible sequel. Like there's enough there for fans of the game that they know what they know like oh here's the part where I'm where I'm supposed to like laugh because I'm just like I understand this I recognize this from the games yeah. like I think maybe maybe if you did, if you came into this and you didn't know Mortal Kombat whatsoever you had like zero degrees of like knowing the universe like you came in you haven't played any of the games you don't know anything about it I think there might be like a different set of expectations there but you know as a like what was it an hour 40 it was something about like that. that yeah I think. but like for those for that hour 40 or something it's just it's just a good switch off your brain have fun sort of movie yeah that that's that's kind of what i was gonna say um i was people were talking people were criticizing some of the plot points and some of the lack of character development um and I felt myself saying, like, why are they, why are they setting those standards, or why are they going into that stuff? Because I feel like this, because I don't want to be one of those people that say the video games are dumb, and that you know, if there's a movie, it's going to be dumb. Because I think there is some smart video games. Like, uh, I mean, I love Uncharted. I, th- I think those characters are as good as any movie you're going to see. Uh, Metal Gear Solid is is nuts, but in terms of epic scale, and you know, s- s- some of the visuals are just amazing uh so i don't think games are inherently dumb but mortal kombat itself is a pretty basic thing that people like about it it's it's interesting kind of large in life characters kicking each other's ass with a cool soundtrack and of course i I actually do think that this movie does elevate some things above that because i think that's a scorpion character and sub-zero uh that opening is at 15 minutes something like that it's just i I think it's superb. I think it's if you didn't know it was Mortal Kombat, you would like, what is this movie? It's it's, it's awesome. Um, so I think that stuff is just amazing. I, I even think that uh, you know the Sub Zero in general, his character, he, as we said, but we're going to talk about Terminator, but his character shows up like this immediate threat that you're just like, what the fuck are they going to do? Because uh, this guy is really scary and he's really really well delivered so yeah people are nitpicking these are the same people that like the original movie which i like as well but it is a cheesy dumb movie so i don't know why they're they're holding standards for this new one uh and maybe not for the older one what what do you think about that Uh, do you think that people are looking too much into looking for character development and stuff like that or what do you think I think you're right there. They are looking for too much of that. Like, you have to remember that Mortal Kombat started as an arcade game. Like, they're, like, sure, it had home console versions, but it's extremely rooted in arcades. Which means, like, up until the fourth game that came out in that series, there was virtually zero character development going on. Yeah. Because... You had maybe like a splash screen going into the arcade mode after you pick your character with like maybe like a half of a paragraph of text telling you like who they are and why they're here. And then uh, maybe the same amount uh, as an ending after you complete the game. And, you know, that's there's no real character development that you can do there because you, you've only got like like maybe a, one or two screens worth of text to build upon. Yeah. So you didn't have that in the original games. It wasn't until Mortal Kombat 4 which was built for the home for like the home consoles in mind that they started even approaching like something resembling character development. Like sure they had like the ongoing story yeah. but there wasn't anything that said like oh well he's kind of he started off as a bad guy and then he started having second thoughts and maybe he like turned good or something like that or like defected like you couldn't really do that in those games it's just like you 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 showed up you mash buttons you win or you lose you know i thought i thought visually and the way they shot it um was really good as well i mean people will probably say uh there wasn't anything that amazing about it but 
you know, for a video game to uh, to movie uh, movie for them to not overdo green screen. I mean, I know that obviously there was green screen, there was a lot of CGI, but uh, the director has said that they tried to do everything on location as much as possible, and I think you do see that. There's no scenes where you have people with a with a really kind of fake looking background a lot of the time you know you really feel like they're in a set that's been built obviously there's stuff being added in the background that of course that happens but if, if you've seen stuff like uh again we're bringing terminator up again before we bring it up uh properly <laughs> but like the last two terminator movies ended with a uh 15 or 20 minute action scene where you absolutely knew that knew that nothing in this on the screen was actually there they were standing on a uh, is it a green screen or a blue screen set where everything's been added in afterwards? There's helicopter chases where the helicopters aren't real. With the Mortal Kombat movie, with all the crazy stuff going on in it, they actually were on set most of the time. You actually can feel that. You feel that they went to the desert in one of the scenes. They're actually there. Uh, there's that car chase to start. It feels like a car chase that there actually could have been in any movie. So stuff like that, to me, maybe it's just a personal thing, but... The fact that it's not some green screen uh, CGI fest, even though there is a lot of CGI, uh, I think that was a smart, a smart decision and a, and a welcome decision. Yeah, I think I think so too. Like, like there's n- like the one thing that can really pull you out of a mu- movie is poorly executed CGI, and I'm really glad mm-hmm. that it was kept to a minimum. Like, sure, you have to do that for like some of the powers, like Raiden's thunder powers, Kano's yep. laser eye ball. And like other stuff and other stuff like that, but you know, that stuff is understandable because it's magic. It's supposed to be uh, supposed to be fantasy. Yeah, and it's but, the, it's it's the know, only way they could do it as well because yeah. you know if if you if you're going to have a, a flaming dragon uh, as a power, uh, you can't do that <laughs> practically. But like if you're yeah, on absolutely. if you're on a set, you can do that practically. Uh, and they decided to do it here, and they didn't decide to just do it on a, a green screen set. Um, yeah. So to me, I, I thought it was entire, really, really fun. I think the reaction has been, you know, the, the reaction is quite mixed. I think on both sides. I think critics, it's, it's around a fifty on Rotten Tomatoes the last time I checked, uh, which, um, you know, is I suppose is kind of understandable. I think it's a lot better than that. I I I, I think the fans. I'm surprised when. I, I, d- I decided not to look at the reviews from anybody, fans or critics, before saying I just said, I'm going to watch this. I have high hopes for it. I hope it's not going to suck. I hope it's actually... I, I really thought it would be really good, and I really did enjoy it. And I was surprised that there was a reaction from a, s- a p- quite large portion of fans that uh, was quite negative, but I think a lot of people enjoyed it too, and I, I think financially, I know it's a weird time to to know if anything's doing that well. But I feel like it's it's going to get a sequel just based on the reaction and the the, the talk from people. Um, yeah. Well, the thing about the thing about the fi- first the thing about the financial thing is that sure, like it came out at done number one at the box office. I can't remember how much it drew, but also you have to take into account that one, there's probably not a lot of movie theaters that are open and operating because you know it's twenty twenty one. It's the times that we live in. But you also have to look at it as well. Warner Brothers uh, finance distributed the movie. It's gone through HBO Max as well. So you have that home audience to think of as well. Like, what, like, how well did that movie create new subscribers for HBO Max? Because that should surely mm. uh, integrate into the. Uh, I think that's going to be the big thing, yeah. I, I think if if it's well, translated, you know, yeah. yeah, I think it. If whole, it I think it yeah. will have translated because I feel like it was a big release. Um, I felt there was a lot of talk about. It. Maybe that's because I was interested and 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 thought and you know tried to find the the the, the, the reactions of people and online and stuff. But I, I did feel like there was a lot of interest in it. Um, and I think I mean I, I watched King Kong a few weeks ago and I. Maybe the movie itself just wasn't that good, but I didn't feel like it was a big release, even though it was uh, a big movie to be released. It, it just that was a movie that felt like it needed to be seen in the cinema, and I think Mortal Kombat in a cinema with a big crowd would have been awesome. Uh, 
but it did. I did feel like I was watching something new and special. Um, and that coming from somebody that isn't a big, big, big Mortal Kombat fan, I think is a positive thing. So, um, do you have anything else to say on Mortal Kombat before we move on? I th- I I think it may have sneak, uh, perhaps not so quietly uh, sneaked into my top five video game to movie adaptations actually. Well, like, because, uh, simply interesting. Because but I, what what is your favorite video game movies off the top of your head that you actually do think is good and that you would? Uh, maybe off the top of my head, I know the absolute lock for number one of my favorite video game to movie adaptations is Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. It's in right. Japanese, so like I don't know that well, that might. Uh, might affect some of you. I don't. I didn't get an English dub. But I think it's only available in Japan. But I uh, was able to watch it by you know alternative methods. <laughs> right. But uh, it's a really fun movie. It stays incredibly faithful to the source material, which is like campy courtroom drama, super exaggerated characters with exaggerated looks. And it stays perfectly faithful to those. Like, you see the characters in the movie. Like, they're not, like, down-to-earth versions of the game characters. Like, they've got the costumes, right? They've got that same kind of Japanese anime-looking hair. Perfect in the movie. Yeah. The costumes are right. The feel is right. Surely took a little bit of liberties with some things. Just to kind of maybe modernize them a little bit. But the story is lifted straight from the game in that in that part, so like that straight away is a slam dunk because you know you can definitely tell that a lot better in a movie and than well, you can probably yeah. in a kind of that kind of visual novel style that the game is used to. Right. Um, what other ones did you like? Um. In terms of video games to movies, I. Yeah. Like, the original Mortal Kombat movie, not Armageddon, the, just the original one, right. is also pretty high up there. Like, it's it's camp, it's a little bit stupid at times, but again, like, turn your brain off for an hour and a half, it's still a lot of fun to watch. There's a lot of replay value there. I don't really know what would possibly round out my top five. I actually, for... For all of the criticism and all the flack that it got, I actually enjoyed the Max Payne movie whenever it. That's got, an interesting one because I, I was just thinking of that. I, that was one of the ones that I found was a big disappointment. Um, but that's interesting that you enjoyed it. Um, for me, if, if you want to keep thinking about any other ones, well, I'm uh, less of my ends. I, as I say, the Alicia Vikander Tomb Raider. Have you seen that yet? I actually haven't. That, but that, the, that first, one, the first Angelina Jolie Tomb Raider, that was really, really good. I enjoyed that one. Yeah, I, I think that's really underrated. I mean, it, it's not a, like, neither are, you know, five-star movies, but I, I just think they're really solid action adventure movies. Um, uh, what else did I like? Um, I thought the two Hitman movies were flawed. Um, you know, they, they, it's a, it's a, I think it's a tough and an easy game to try and, get together uh, or, or make a movie out of Hitman because I feel like it's not that hard to crack that um, but I feel like on both ca- both movies Hitman uh, with Timmy Oliphant and the Hitman 40, Agent 47 with I forget that actor's name uh, I think both of them Is got stuff right and they messed up stuff on both of them as well um, I, I thought the Warcraft movie I, I, have you seen that James I thought that was terrific Warcraft movie is, uh, is also really great. That would probably round out my top five. Yeah. Just outside the top five, though, Sonic the Hedgehog. I really, really enjoyed that movie. Yeah, that was a really good movie. That's a solid movie. That's that, a movie that... That's the uh, one that surprised me the most. Yeah. Um, another one, as I just thought of there, is the... Uh, again, it's a flawed movie, but I think the first Silent Hill movie, have you seen that? I, I think that visually... if. if forget about everything else about it visually it's really a beautiful movie like i mean silent hill is visually a really interesting game like uh, i think i think a lot of directors who movie directors who pride themselves on interesting visuals would be 
would be really, uh, or people in general of art of anything, like the, the Silent Hill games are are scarily beautiful. Uh, just that really creepy kind of uh, mysterious um, location that game set, and I think the movie d delivered that really well. That I think that's an underrated one. Um, uh, I didn't see the sequel to that, but the first movie. So there's a few of those that I think are. I mean, people keep. As, I think the problem I have. I know there's a lot of bad video game t movies, uh, the movies, but I think there's some really, really solid ones. Maybe no five star movies, but um, I yeah, think more. Yeah, definitely not. I don't think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think uh, I think we'll leave the Mortal Kombat discussion there. In the comments, let us know what you thought. Um, uh, were you do you agree with us that it was a fun movie or do you think uh it was a disappointment let us know uh next on the chat here we're going to talk about the terminator franchise if you follow my channel before i'm a big terminator guy uh, it's been a really controversial few years for the franchise because the last two movies have been uh what's the word for it a disaster uh you've had uh, terminator genesis that was uh and actually pretty uh, financially okay movie because China pushed it up uh, in, in a respect that it actually did pretty well worldwide. Terminator Dark Fate that was released, uh, I think, was that 2018? Could be wrong, 2019 possibly, I think it was 2019. Um, it was a financial disaster. Uh, and the franchise at th this point is really, I don't think anybody knows where it's going. A lot of people say it shouldn't go anywhere. Uh, but generally what I want to speak about is where did this franchise go wrong? Uh, how could they mess it up so royally? In my opinion, the first Terminator uh, was a really simple but really uh, still hold, hold, holds up today. Maybe visually they could... I know people hate remasters and they hate people uh, like George, George Lucas going in and changing and adding stuff. Uh, after the fact, I think that's a movie that if they fix some of the uh, visuals, uh, maybe reshot a few scenes, it would uh, still hold up a lot. But in, it, maybe that's just me uh, talking nonsense. The movie itself still holds up as a great uh, sci-fi horror movie. The sequel, Judgment Day, was an uh, was a different but faithful, I think, movie. Uh, it, it was a lot more action-based. It was a little bit more lighter. Still a lot of violence in there, but you had Arnold Schwarzenegger becoming a big, big action star. You had Robert Patrick as this amazing villain. And the, it just was a, you know, even if you prefer the original movie, you got to admit the second movie really did feel like a home run and possibly one of the best sequels ever made. Terminator 3, for my, for my liking, was a solid sequel. It got a lot of flack at the time, but I think if people were to see where the franchise was going to go, they'd probably like I do now, kind of sit and go, Terminator 3 was probably the best sequel um, since Terminator 2. And then you have Salvation, which was a uh, kind of odd movie that kind of, uh, you know, you had the Christian Bale rant on set that kind of became a, a thing, really probably nothing to do with the movie, but it, it kind of set up that maybe this movie wasn't going to be good. I personally think it's quite a bland movie, but not a bad movie. And then the franchise um, went on to uh, uh, Genesis, which was a really a bizarre kind of... Um, it was a bizarre uh, kind of campy uh, movie that was all over the place. You had, you know, attempts of humor that were bizarre. You had changing of the cast... Like Jay Courtney as uh, as Kyle Reese was bizarre. You had Amelia Clark, who's an okay actress, but she became she is not Linda Hamilton. Um, and the movie was weird. It was fun if it wasn't Terminator because there's a lot there is a lot of fun to be had. The action's fun, um, but it's a weird weird movie with a lot of missteps. And then you have Dark Fate, which, for my money, uh, the killing of John Connor in the first ten minutes was a bad move, it alienated fans, Tim Miller and James Cameron, uh, some of their stuff, their arguments off, uh, or after, the, or on the release of the movie, suggested that they had a lot of arguments, fans didn't like it, the box office was a disaster. My question is, where did it go wrong? How could it go so badly wrong? Why, out of all these sequels, could they not sit down and get somebody that understood the first two movies? Um, 
or even look at the third movie and say to themselves, uh, you know, th that movie was, you know, rehashing a lot of stuff, uh, but respecting the, the original movies the most of all the sequels. Um, what do you think, JC? You've you've seen uh, you've seen most of the sequels. You haven't seen Dark Fate, the last one. Uh, where do you think they went wrong, and how could they mess it up so royally? And what did you think about the Terminator Three, Salvation, Genesis? It's a it's a tricky one for me because I haven't I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen Salvation pretty much since it came out. I haven't gone back to watch that again. That probably, says a, that probably says a lot. <laughs> because again, uh, I just have personally speaking, like I don't have, I just have this thing where like I don't really rewatch re stuff that I've seen before. But Salvation is definitely not one of those movies that I'm not in a hurry to ever rewatch again. Yeah, I yeah. just think that was just dour. It was, it was a poor attempt at the franchise. I think what is going wrong now, I, may, I may be wrong here so please feel free to call me out in the comments but I think what's going wrong is too many people are giving are being given a shot here at writing a Terminator movie and like trying to deliver that because the franchise is in an extremely unique position because of because of the because of the plot of it like it's okay, they can release a bad movie that can still do well in the box office, but because they have the whole time travel part of, the, you know, the entire plot is, like, pretty much based around time-traveling robots from the future coming back to the past to try and alter the course of history, that they can just complete, they can just go back to before the bad movie happens and try and retcon everything that happens in it. Yeah. And then a, another, they make another bad movie trying to do that, another bad movie trying to fix the bad movie that tried to fix the bad movie, and it keeps, it keeps escalating from there. Because they can get away with it. Like, they can't just sit down and, and say, like, okay, we actually have to do a good one of these. I mean, they do eventually, because sooner or later, you know, fans like ourselves are going to get tired of it and it's like well the last couple were bad then this clearly has a track record I'm going to wait for it to come out on a streaming service or Blu-ray or something like that and not go see it at the box yeah, office I, 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 I think that's, that's a big thing to um, tell the production studios that you know we're not interested in this anymore and eventually we're not going to get any more yeah I think that's a big thing that you sorry, brought up on. sorry yeah um I think that's a big thing that you said that they feel they can get away with it because I think with Star Wars, um, I know there's a lot of talk in the last few uh, years about kind of toxic fandom, which is a which is a thing that I uh, I can kind of understand, but I, I think it gets overblown with some things. I, th I think fan fandoms and their kind of rage, if it's as long as it isn't hateful. Um, I think it's fine. I think if people are really, really passionate and are really critical, that's 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 good by me. It might some people might find it irritating to listen to, but as long as it doesn't become kind of hatred towards uh, actors and directors and stuff, I think it's fine. But I think with Star Wars, if they do a really terrible Star Wars movie, the fans will go nuts and they will hold people to. Uh, uh, hold people to that and they will not want those people back and in one way I guess Terminator that's happened too but I feel like as you say they feel they can get away with it um, I don't think there was a pressure and in the last three movies to get it right or to see what they've done wrong um, you know you just can't hire just anybody to make a movie to try and recreate what was good about the first two movies um, you know, you, you look at something like um, even Mortal Kombat. We were talking about Mortal Kombat and how Sub-Zero enters the movie and him walking down the street and uh, using his powers to fire uh, ice and stuff. You know, okay, okay no Terminator is going to be f uh, using ice powers. But generally that feeling of this, this kind of really threatening uh, villain pursuing the good guys, 
that's what Terminator is all about. That's it's a very basic element of those movies. Uh, the the T- Terminator Dark Fate um, didn't get that right at all because the the the, 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 the villain himself did, was, uh, to me wasn't that threatening. I mean, they they felt like, I think they thought they had this threatening villain, but they really didn't. I mean, Robert Patrick was such a great casting because he he done so little, but and uh, what I mean is that he didn't do anything flashy. Uh, he wasn't he, his character didn't have to do anything. Whereas Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, is such a yeah, such a, a large. It's, yeah. co- it's a real contrast when you look back at Terminator Two. That the idea that like these two robots are going head to head with each other, and yet Arnold the robot from the first movie uh, is suddenly having to learn some sort of humanity to him whereas Mm. Robert Patrick is the T-1000 he's coming in and he's acting like super like super robotic to the point where like he has like like he's obviously been programmed with like the mission to terminate John Connor and you know he nails that role perfectly because he acts so wooden and so stiff but that's the entire point is because that's what that's what the t-1000 was programmed to do like he's not supposed to be flashy he's not supposed to he's not supposed to uh what do you say show any like signs of humanity or anything only just enough to enough to pass as it if he's in disguise so like yep. he doesn't, but then again, that's that wouldn't be Robert Patrick. Then that would be just like the stand-in character that you know is filling in. So like obviously, that's not going to be him playing the role of someone that he's morphed into. And I think there's a there's a thing about the uh, Terminator Two, especially that you know it's it's one of those scenes that I think if any director uh, is trying to make a Terminator sequel, that they should look at this one scene. It's the scene. Uh, where Robert Patrick uh, and Arnold meet for the first time, I believe, and it's in a corridor. It's in this really simple corridor, and both of them start shooting at each other, and then both of them start fighting each other. Uh, and you know, there's no throwing of characters into the sky. There's no. They do smash through a wall. It's in the wall, I believe. Yeah, um, they smash through a wall. It's in an yeah. arcade. Yeah, but like, there's no. Uh, there's no CGI. They couldn't do it at that time anyway. If they wanted to, uh, there's no CGI uh, ragdoll uh, stunt car. They don't, you know, the, no, no character needs to be thrown into through twenty planes of glass out of a skyscraper, landing through buildings. It's just two people on the ground, or sorry, two terminators on the ground fighting each other. It's simple. They even when the uh, the T one thousand gets shot. Uh, they they put tin foil I think I believe it was something like a tin foil uh, pr- uh, prosthetic uh, thing to show the um, the the bullet wound and the T one thousand simple stuff like that you know it wasn't flashy then you go and you look at as I said earlier uh, it, when I'm talking about Mortal Kombat you have uh, in, in the last two Terminator movies Genesis and Dark Fit you have the last twenty minutes are these uh, CGI fests of just Lazy. I mean, I, I I I like CGI. CGI is is amazing. It's it. Terminator Two was such a pioneering uh, kind of start for CGI because people had not seen stuff like that. But it was used minimally. Then you've got Genesis and Dark Fate, where the last two fight scenes, you've got a CGI environment. None of it's real at all. You've got Arnold Schwarzenegger as being used as a CGI double, been thrown around. None of it's believable. So my point is, when you look at those first two movies, sure those movies were lower budget and they had restrictions on what they could do, but no person making a Terminator movie should be getting that far away from having two characters on the ground fighting simply, no uh, overuse of CGI. But they don't seem to get that. Uh, again, as I said, there's a t- you've seen Genesis. Do you remember the terrible helicopter chase where everything's CGI? The helicopters aren't real. Um, to me, it's that's a big thing, and the reason why these movies just do not feel like good Terminator movies or good action movies. 
Yeah, unfortunately, I do remember that helicopter chase scene for all the wrong reasons. Because you, you yeah. remember in Terminator 2, the helicopter chase where they actually... Uh, the T-1000 drives a helicopter under a bridge, and they actually did that, I believe. Um, or they did that with a stunt yeah. pilot, yes. You know, and then you go to Genesis where it's, 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 it's everything CGI, everything looks fake. It's That's a big thing. I, I just don't think these people understand what they were trying to make. Yeah, um, I, I don't I don't think so either, but going yeah. back to Mortal Kombat again, and I know this is something that we do, what we're probably going to end up doing a lot during this podcast, is going back and looking at previous topics, but I forget his name, the director of Mortal Kombat, but I remember reading an interview with him saying like he played a lot of that movie, that, sorry, not of that movie, sorry, the game yeah. in the arcade, and he had a lot of love for that series, and you can tell that in the way that it's shot how faithful they are to having real actors and real stunt people doing real fights there's not a lot of CGI in there and it, sh- it absolutely shows through that movie about how much care and how much attention that they're giving it whereas Terminator just I don't know it, it just seems very by the numbers now you like you almost know what's going to happen whenever you go in and that's kind of a sad indictment on the movie. It's like, if I know what's going to happen in a 100 hour movie, then that makes me less inclined to, you know, want to spend money to go buy a ticket. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a good point. Uh, uh, I believe the director of uh, the new Mortal Kombat was Simon uh, McQuaid. Or Simon yes, Mc- that's Mc- uh, yeah, yes, that's he, correct. He sounds like a guy that, he, he's a guy that understands what he's, what he's supposed to be doing, which isn't necessarily going to mean it's going to be a great movie but it's a starting point that they have somebody that knows how to respect the characters you know he's not going to just kill off some big character uh in the first five minutes because he wants to get a reaction i mean the killing of john connor uh you know that was a sign of somebody a director you know you had uh, tim miller director of dark fate saying that uh i believe i believe him and james cameron said that they were tired of seeing male uh, action stars uh, be the only thing that people seen which I thought when I heard that first like well okay you mean bringing back Linda Hamilton uh, is a great thing she was amazing in the first two movies uh, but then that came back to haunt uh, haunt me because they killed off uh, John Connor in the first five, ten minutes uh, they, they said in an under interview that Kyle Reese who was a big part of the first movie uh uh, and a beloved character in the franchise that he doesn't exist anymore because of what they've done with Dark Fit. So you have these two directors who, um, I mean, I don't like to get into the whole politics thing. I mean, I have no problem with female-led action movies. But when you have directors who seem to want to uh, remove male characters because they've got some political reason for doing it, I just think that that's a bizarre thing. I mean, that kind of happened in Star Wars with uh, uh, Mark Hamill. Not really the same reason, but they, they, there was a, uh, rumblings that they wanted to get rid of older characters because they wanted to get the new characters. It's kind of like wrestling, what we'll be speaking about later. You get rid of uh, the more over guys because uh, you want to get the younger guys over. Uh, it's a bizarre... Um, Okay, it's a different, uh, completely different medium, movies and wrestling, but for movies, it's, it, it's really bizarre. Why would you get rid of a beloved character for no reason other than you want to uh, push a new character? Um, I think that's a really bizarre mindset to be in. What do you think? I mean, I, I want to go back to like what you said like about a minute or so ago about like how... Uh, Mortal Kombat didn't want to kill a major character in like the first five or ten minutes, and yet Scorpion died. <laughs> well, Which, but you know, they is, they backed it's, that it's, up. Like, it, but you know, like in that case, it's fine. It's a Mortal Kombat movie. People are supposed to die. Like that. Yeah. That's like fatalities are the point of the entire game. Like it's, it was um, built on the shock value of watching fighters literally kill each other on screen. But in that point, the spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, the Scorpion character does get a, get to return in an awesome way. So they've, you know, they, it wasn't like they sidetracked that character and dumped him and, like, 
who cares about him anymore? Or they, mm. you know, they give him a cool uh, return. Yeah, he does. He does get a cool return return arc. Which John Con- John movie. Connor gets no return. John Connor is uh, he's just super killed. Dead. <laughs> you know, and you know it's an interesting. You know, people people have said to me, well, the John Connor character uh, has been done has been done before and it didn't really do it, it it's uh it hasn't worked in salvation and didn't they feel it didn't work in terminator tree uh and they felt that they had to go somewhere different but they don't go somewhere different in dark fate they bring in a female character which again i'm not making that that's a problem but that this female character is the exact same character uh it's, it's so that they've replaced them with nothing new uh, they're just redoing and annoying fans by getting rid of that character um you know and um i've lost my like, train i think of thought. there could be room there could yeah. be room in the series for both of them if you have them like like i know yes, that, that you said think... like they're similar but like you can have them play off each other and create a completely different dynamic there yeah that but, that's you know that's keep, a good point like you, it, you, like you you you've got to respect one those one. characters while if you as as I think that they were probably right, they do need new characters to uh, to maybe carry more movies and maybe add interesting things. But you cannot uh, disrespect what came before. Yeah, I I mean I agree with you there, but like like as you said, like and we'll get to this in the wrestling portion of the podcast later. But like you can't just like completely get rid of like the veteran characters if you want to, you know. As, like get the new ones popular or get people get people talking about the new characters like you can have them you can have them play off each other in a way that you know they naturally pass the torch and advance while still advancing the storyline you can absolutely do that you don't have to like kill one and then completely replace the other like yeah like, it's one of those things you, you can John have your cake and it, like, you can have your cake of, like, and eat it but they don't seem yeah. to understand that like you can have John Connor turn into like some sort of like time traveling nomad guy that just like follows Terminator well, through my, time. Well, my my idea them. was that um, like you could totally do that. If they, and if they that, weren't that too like big on having remo- John that, John like yeah. removes him, so, like sure he could just like show up here and there in like future movies. Absolutely. Yeah, that that was my mindset. That if they wanted to have a new character, a female character, be the centerpiece of Dark Fit. Uh, that John Connor could still be there. He could be a smaller character that is talked about, but then shows up at the end of that movie and helps out uh, our Arnold Schwarzeneggers, our Linda Hamiltons. Uh, and that means that everybody gets what they want. If the directors want fresh new characters, maybe a female character, they can have that. Um, and the people, the fans that don't want to see their favorite characters getting you know, removed, get what they want. But uh, it's... I think that's a big thing with Terminator is that I don't feel like they know what uh, people fans liked uh, and you know you listen to James Cameron I think he's fascinated with his Avatar movies and I don't think he well obviously he wasn't on he said he wasn't on set nearly at all for Terminator Dark Fit so he didn't really care about that that movie at all which you know yeah like at this stage I think the I think the franchise is just in the bin for him and he's just like moved on yeah. it's just like okay well, you can you can do your own thing, but I'm like completely disowning everything you do in this future timeline. So like you can do your own thing and completely separate it from the project. Yeah. Which you know I can understand like if he's disappointed or like anything from like what they've done since he left the franchise, and like only just came back in like a consultancy role. Like I'm sure he had like plenty of useful input into like where to where to bring the series or what direction they move in. But when they're writing these movies from one to the next, they're not writing with anything long term in mind, and you can tell that. Because yeah, it, if if they had something in mind for like two or three movies down the line, you know, they would build for that. They would make that into a big moment. They wouldn't just throw away the killing of John Connor in the first five minutes of a movie. Like they would build, they would build up to that, and like have him in, like a much grandiose fight, and 
have him lose, and then that sets up the cliffhanger for another movie, yeah. which would be the redemption arc for like whoever is going to avenge his death. I mean, I think there's a quote that sums up this all great, uh, terrifically. It, it, I think Tim Miller, Tim Miller, who directed the last movie, he said that um, he didn't want John Connor to be around because it's like it was he he spoke about him like he was uh a distracting sort of uh relative that you just didn't want to have around at a wedding he's like we got to get rid of him uh so the new characters don't have to be overshadowed by him which is such a bizarre mindset i mean it it's kind of like arnold schwarzenegger in the new movie only shows up for the last 40 minutes maybe 30 minutes uh is another decision, you know, that you, you've maybe that was kind of understandable if if you wanted to give him a smaller part, but you know, again, he shows himself. I mean, we 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 if you if you're into wrestling, you know, larger than life, older stars that uh, are still popular. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the best thing about the last three movies, um, and his his I think it, obviously he's getting older now. I mean, if they do make a movie in five years, he probably won't be able to be in it. Um, but I think his his loss to the franchise is a big chunk of it, because I think he was a big part of the personality, uh, his just general kind of presence in movies is terrific. Um, you know, I would always say if Arnold Schwarzenegger is able to be in a Terminator movie, he should be in it if it makes sense and if it's if it's if, if it's possible. Um, but yeah, I think in the future we're going to talk about. Uh, how you could reboot Terminator, but I think unless you want to say anything else, JC, we'll go on to the next subject. No, I think I've I think I've said my pieces on Terminator for, at least for one day, anyway. Okay, James. Um, uh, well, next, we're going to talk about we're going to just touch on uh, Days Gone Two, which was a big conversation in the last while. Oh, that uh, it sure uh, was a conversation, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Uh, um, talked about it. Um, I personally thought the perception of the game the last uh, six months or so has really started to rise, and I thought, you know, the, 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 with all the kind of uh, bizarre, no, not bizarre, but all the kind of questionable sequels that games have gotten the last few years, I thought Days Gone 2 was definitely going to get one. I thought, you know, the sales are good. I don't know the sales off uh, offhand here, um, but it did sell well. Um, They've said that the sequel isn't going to happen because they felt that the release of the movie was lukewarm, that uh, critics uh, didn't respond well to it, um, and that, that the movie, or sorry, that the game is not going to get a sequel. To me, I think that's a bizarre thing. I think if you look at the the response to it, you look at the interest in the PC uh, port, which is coming quite soon. Um, to not give it a sequel is uh, is bizarre in my opinion. What do you think, JC, about sequels to the game? What criteria do you think a game uh, needs to deliver on to get a sequel? Do you think that listening to critics being a bit sniffy about uh, maybe a wonky opening uh, release of a you know that maybe needs a, an update or two to to fix things? You know, this isn't a cyberpunk game. This isn't a game that was broken, but it was a game that was a little bit flawed. Do you think that's a good enough reason for a game that sold well in the preceding years to not get a sequel? I'm I'm not so sure about that. I mean, it did sell well, and it's de- like you said, it definitely has seen a sort of a, a sort of a turn over the last couple of months, where you know people are starting to finally warm up to the game but uh, like I have like honestly speaking like I haven't played the game I don't have a console but I'm I am looking forward to playing it on PC when it comes out later on this month yeah but it, it did sell pretty well like it's like compared to compared to other like first party Sony exclusive games like it outsold both God of War and Horizon Zero Dawn in its first and if you compared their like first three weeks against each other, Days Gone outsold both of those games. Both of those games have approved sequels going forward, but Days Gone hasn't. And you're just like, yeah. what's going on here? That's a really interesting it's like, point. It's and it's it's 
like you said, like, sure, the game was a little bit flawed. It, it started off a little bit rough and it got refined, you know. If I had a couple of patches, it kind of figured itself out. And, you know, it, it grew more into, like, what it wanted to be. And I think... I think a sequel would definitely help nail that down a little bit better. But at the same time, like I'm I'm not the paymasters at Sony. Maybe if the maybe if the PC version sells pretty well, maybe they'll have like a change of change of heart or a change of tune. That was the question of yeah, that was the question I put to you. Do you think if the PC version uh it delivers well do you think if, if if it if it becomes if it gets obviously i think people are going to review it again with the pc ports probably going to get a separate wave of views reviews that you know this is going to be a hopefully a, a stable uh, they should have no excuse not to have a stable release from pc uh do you think if the reception is good and sales again get a big push that uh it could change um the mindset of people at Sony, because I think the reaction has been quite strong uh, already, that people aren't happy. I think that's all, at the end of the day, if they see money signs, they're going to go back and, I believe, I think if it gets a good release on PC, that they'll they'll change their minds. Yeah, I do think, I do think so. Like, sure, like, it, it was, re- like, the sequel was rejected, apparently, I'm just reading here, according to Jason Schreier of Bloomberg, that it, that the sequel was pitched back in 2019, so this is, like, two years ago, but it was rejected due to, like, the mixed reception it got at the time of its release, and because of how long it took them to get it out the door. But I think because they have the, f- the first game done, they have the game engines kind of set, they know what they're working with. I think that, you know, taking the lengthy development time as a factor, I don't think that's really a big thing anymore because, you know, the developers that they have at Ben Studio are now familiar with the engine, are familiar with the tools that they need to make a sequel and are in a better place to deliver it so I don't think I don't think that one really washes with me but I think I do think that you know the the PC sales might tell a different story because do, 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 I just want you I think you're you're what you're more than know about uh, the whole steam situation PC fan base how do you think a game like that's going to be received uh, how, in sales in sales, uh, in, the, in the topic of sales, and the interest of—I know it's very hard to say—but people that you know, uh, the general perception of people on Steam. Do you think that there's going to be an interest to play a game that a lot of these people th- that maybe don't have a uh, a PS uh, a PS4, PS5? Do you think they're going to be interested to play this? Absolutely, I do. I do think that, and that's because there's there's big precedent for it. Uh, as I meant, I meant, I brought up Horizon Zero Dawn before in sales figures. Like when it came to PC, it sold gangbusters. It done really well for Sony, and that was probably the game that gave them second thoughts about making PC ports of their first party titles. Maybe not immediately, but you know, a year or two down the line. Death Stranding also done very well for them, even though I mean it wasn't Sony that published the PC version, but. That was a PS4 exclusive game, and Sony helped finance that game. It came to PC like seven or eight months after the PlayStation version came out, and again, it sold really well. There's, there's a lot of people that are like myself. They have PCs, but they don't have consoles, and they just want to experience the same stuff as everyone else. So, you know, when when that second release comes out there's that second wave of interest and then you get a, another wave of console by console game players who may pick it up later that missed the boat on it the first time round so it definitely does help yeah um I, i'm just thinking mods as well i mean if people are going to be able to replace the zombie characters and the hordes i mean i think that could be a really exciting mod <laughs> To have like there's uh, definitely potential maybe, there for sure. Maybe but I don't even I don't even think mods have anything to do with it. It's 
really down to, and the, you're going to see this a lot going going into the future, and definitely is starting to have an effect even right now. Is streaming the game, like if it, like if popular streamers pick up the PC version, and they probably will because you know they already have powerful PCs that are able to not only run and play these games, but also be able to like render video and broadcast from these same computers simultaneously like it's gonna like there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna be like out there streaming the game it's gonna get popular on on twitch on youtube gaming and facebook gaming even and that's gonna bring a lot of eyes on, onto the game that maybe might have missed it the first time around or they were just like okay well i don't have a console at this moment in time i'm not super interested in this game right now because i don't have a means to play it, so now that they do, maybe that will generate some further interest that way. Yeah, it's 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 going to be fascinating to see because I I think unless they completely, you know, make the same mistakes again and and release a a really unstable PC port, which they have no excuse to do this time. Uh, if they deliver something good, and this game, uh, the PC version, uh, I don't know all the specs, but I, I know it's 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 uh, its performance is going to be much better even than what the PC or the PS5 update is allowed. Um, it could look even more. It's going to look even more beautiful than it did on a PS5 on PS4. Um, so I think if people give it a, a chance, and I think the there's going to be a appetite with fans to push this uh, to do well and of course just generally I think people are going to be interested to play this uh, really big uh, PS or PlayStation uh, exclusive game on PC um, yeah I, th I think I think this is I think it, this is a chance for the, the, the if for people that, that want the sequel that uh, if this goes well they, they could very well change the tide um, and I hope it does. Um, and I think it. I think it's. I think if fans want. I. I always feel the, the, the way if, if if fans want a sequel to something and want to see more of something, uh, and especially if there's a lot of big sales, I think they should get it. And uh, obviously the people, uh, based on Twitter, the people that made the game, they obviously want to do it. So it's not like they're sort of being forced to make a sequel. Like a lot of stuff. Like movies get sequels that you know the people the people are just doing it for the money. I think these guys at Ben's Studio they really wanted to do it. Maybe they re need need to rethink their pitch idea. Maybe that needs to be changed, and probably they might admit to that themselves. Um, but yeah, hopefully this isn't, isn't the last we hear of uh, Days Gone, and uh, hopefully we can look at the uh, the release of PC in a few weeks' time and see uh, how people t are taking to it. Um, but yeah, we're going to go on to, uh, I think, James, you have a topic you want to chat about next, so uh, I'll let you take away that. I do have, but just before we close the book on Days Gone, uh, can we just talk about John Garvin's comments a couple of weeks ago? I, w how he said <laughs> I wasn't going to open that can of uh, can of worms, but if you want to open it, I'll let you... Uh, I mean, uh, at this point, it's, it's impossible to have a conversation about Days Gone without bringing him up. And we got so close, and then I just had to open it. <laughs> And well, his whole comments about like, oh, let, let, like, okay, yeah, let people like, let, my, let people like, know what what your what what your referencing was. You're sorry, you're probably gonna do that. Okay, so he was he was on a uh, he was on a fellow game designer David Jaffe who made the Twisted Metal series. He was on a YouTube show with him, and he uh, Jaffe had asked him whether he heard anything about any meaningful uptick of engagement with Days Gone since. It got added as a free game uh, on PlayStation Plus a couple of weeks ago, and he, and Garvin replied to him. He's like, "Yeah, if you love a game, play it at full price." And like, I can't tell you how many times I've seen gamers saying like, "Oh yeah, I got it on sale or I got it on PS Plus." And I was like, "Well, like, don't complain if a game doesn't get a sequel if you don't support it at launch and you don't get a full price." Now I have. I have some thoughts about this. I'm sure you're shocked <laughs> that I have some thoughts about this. And they're all, uh, let's say, not great. <laughs> At well, least in Garvin's case. Uh, venture anger? I'm just going to put this out there. It, 
number one, it's a new intellectual property. Like, well, okay, technically, technically, it isn't. It's, it's that's kind of a that's kind of spoiler town. It's it's very, very loosely referenced in just minor Easter eggs in the game, but technically, it isn't an original for an original IP. It's set in a different universe, but. Yeah. You don't really know that until unless you go like digging super deep, but it's a new IP, first of all. So again, you don't really know you don't know if you like it until you play it. And they didn't put out a demo of this before it came out. So again, how do we know if we're going to like it if we don't if we haven't played it? Yeah. So of course, you know, people might be a bit more hesitant about dropping sixty dollars seventy euros seventy dollars however much it is for current gen console games i think it's like i think it's like seventy dollars or seventy euros for new ps4 or ps5 games these days yeah. correct me if i'm wrong there <laughs> i'm a little bit out of touch yeah with pretty console much. prices yeah. but but for something that's like brand new like that like sure you can understand that you know people might be a bit hesitant about buying it straight away and especially because, you know, a lot of games these days ship broken. Like, they have bugs in them that, you know, can lead to, like, get, getting stuck in parts of the map. To get, like, they could accidentally end, like, bugs that could trigger your save files getting deleted. Like, this stuff happens, and it happens an awful, awful lot these days. And, like, games ship in these conditions. Of course people are going to look at the precedent set by like lots of other games not even just saying like sony first party games because most of the time they are of extremely high quality because they have a high standard set for themselves but again like i said it's a new franchise people are just like okay well let's maybe give it a couple of weeks and see what the reception is and wait and see and of course like by that time it's already gone down to like 50 or 40 dollars because Stores are looking to try and just sell the next big thing and try and free up inventory space. So, of course, you know, people are going to be a bit more hesitant if they get it at launch, but what does that matter? Like, you're still getting paid. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's... <laughs> I, I can't really disagree with any of it uh, that you've said. Um, I think the way he... The way he f- phrased and the way he, he, he went about saying that was just a... A really idiotic and kind of I think the other people that work with Ben Studios pretty much pulled them up on it and said that it was idiotic and that they were happy that yeah. that any uh, however you got to play that game that they're happy any way you done it um, you know it's, it was a little bit combative I'll say that and it doesn't really help that he said it on David Jaffe's uh, show who is also known for making those sort of like volatile statements and in the face of his own fans more often than not. I don't know if you've ever followed him on Twitter, but... No. <laughs> yeah, but his own, his own feed's uh, a lot, very full of that as well. Yeah, I, I, I think it's... I think I, I agree with you, and I think that's all I can say on it. It's It was idiotic, and it didn't help the cause. Hopefully the PC release that's coming soon will help the cause. Um, Again, I think we'll we'll come back to Days Gone Two in a few weeks uh, when the PC release happens. Uh, what wh- what else you want to chat about, James? Uh, we're gonna pivot. We're gonna pivot here, and we're going to uh, talk about some sports. So you've probably you've probably you've probably seen in the news. You've probably seen in the back pages, front pages, sports pages, wherever you get your wherever you get your sports news project. Uh, the European Super League. Uh, came and went grand opening, grand closing within the space of about 48 hours 12 teams decided hey let's let's uh, start, go start our own league uh, it was the top 6 from England so we had uh, Manchester City, Manchester United, Chelsea Arsenal, Liverpool Tottenham Hotspur uh, from Italy you had AC Milan Inter Milan, Juventus and in Spain, you had uh, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid. I think there was a 12th team. Was that 10 or 11 or, 11 or, 11 or 12 that I just mentioned there? Um, I, maybe, I'm missing, maybe I'm missing one of the Italian teams. I can't remember, but yeah. 
basically these 12 teams have said like hey what if we just like replace the Champions League with our own Super League we make it like a 20 team league we're going to stay in it all the time no matter how good or bad we perform in and have the other 5 spots invite only and they announced this midnight European time on a Sunday night which is you know the perfect time to announce one of these things because you know that you're going to annoy your entire fan base and and indeed the entire fan base of the global sport (laughs) (laughs) and they knew that this was going to be a bad decision so that's why they tried to sneak out their press press decision uh, press release at midnight but so anyway sports fans across Europe woke up to this on Monday morning that that wasn't a lot was it last week or was it the week before? I can't remember. I, was... I, I think it's, it's... it's The passage of time these days is just whoosh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's got possibly written two weeks or a little bit more. It's, it feels like that in a way. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. It's probably going to be about two weeks from the time this recording goes up. I don't know exactly when this, when this is going up, but it'll be about two weeks from when you're hearing this. So fans across Europe woke up to this and like, hey, what the hell? We didn't sign up for this. We didn't agree to this. Does this mean that we're abandoning our own domestic leagues to go play in this? And they threw a conniption. Fans across Europe uh, threatened to boycott their teams. uh, Cancelled season tickets. Protests outside stadiums all across Europe. Even even protests at, at teams that, you know, had no say in the matter. So like uh, the night uh, the night after this announcement went out, Liverpool played Leeds in the league, and Leeds came out and were wearing shirts from UEFA that said "Airness," as if to say like, "Hey, if you want to play in a, the top tier competitions, you have to obviously earn your spot there. You can't just form a league and say, here, I'm in this all the time, and this is also the best league.'" But you know, a lot of shade was thrown at it by. Uh, Teams that didn't get an invite. (laughs) Teams that were going to be left behind in their domestic leagues. And within the space of about two days, and after numerous protests across across the world, uh, a lot of the owners came out and said, Hey, actually this is kind of a bad idea. Uh, Please don't uh, take your money and spend it elsewhere. We're really sorry. Please please come back. And so the entire league... uh, was founded and disbanded within about a 46 hour time span after all of the, all of the teams except three uh, officially pulled out. So the teams that haven't pulled out so far and I'll get into this I'll get into this more in a second and what this means for them are Real Madrid, Barcelona and Juventus. They're the only three teams so far that have that haven't uh, formally withdrawn their interest in the league or like have come out and said hey this is a bad idea we're sorry so first thing first uh i'm a liverpool fan you're a man united fan so what's your take on all of this and like i know i know man united fans have uh had plenty of battles with ownership since the since the glazer family took over back 10 or so years ago uh this definitely doesn't go paint them in a, po- in a positive light by any stretch of the imagination but no. but as a united fan like do you feel betrayed by your team at all by their interest in splintering off and going off and forming their own thing well i i have to admit that um I mean, I have a local a local team in Ireland that uh, would I would say is my team. So when I talk about, you know, passion for football, I mean, I do love Manchester United. Uh, I do watch them. I have an interest. Um, I don't think I could be as. Um, I think you're a little bit different. I think you and Liverpool, you're a lot more into Liverpool than I would be into Man United. Uh, for me, um, I don't think I was betrayed. Maybe because it, it probably hit isn't doesn't hit home as much as. Uh, my Irish team, uh, you know, I just, to me, it felt, you know, obviously it didn't go ahead, uh, whether it's, there's going to be a, uh, 
whether that's going to be the end of the story, that's a, that's 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 another uh, point completely. To me, it just felt like rich people that have uh, no idea, or maybe they they do, but they don't really care. They have no idea um, about the real world. They don't. They think fans are like. Uh, like little three D models in a game, they're just not real things. They don't particularly care. Uh, they were going to do this because it was going to make them a lot of money. Uh, the history of the clubs wasn't a big thing to them, um, so they could just trample through all that, you know, rip up uh, all these years of history for all these clubs and just uh, do this thing that was going to make them a lot of money. Um, and the reception is was the reception that you've seen, the protest, the anger. Um, because there is real people, you know, as much as people can make fun of the Premier League and other leagues as being just kind of soulless, uh, uh, you know, there's a perception at times they're soulless money-making leagues that there's no, that, that they've lost with all the money in them now, that they've lost a lot of the, the heart and soul that was there. Um, the, the fan base still cares. The, 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 those people that live in Manchester, those people that live in Liverpool, uh, whatever club you want to name, those people care. Those people aren't just going to allow their clubs to be just turned into a, a kind of a, an even bigger money-making uh, charade than maybe it can be at times. So yeah, for me, I, I, again, I, I don't think I got really passionate and anger about it uh, because I, I, pr- I kind of knew it was going to... I kind of knew it wasn't going to really take off because y- you can't you can't just pretend that uh, that there was you, if you felt there was going to be no protests you're an idiot uh, and if you felt you could just get over the protest and it would be gone in a few days you're also an idiot so uh, to me uh, whether it's going to come back again I, I again I just I don't know how they can they can mess with uh, millions and millions of human beings that care about their uh, history of the club yeah it's very uh, it's it is a uh, kind of a weird situation that uh, people find themselves in particularly man united because uh as i'm sure you've seen in the news that uh their match against liverpool last weekend uh had to be postponed because yeah. uh, fans had stormed Old Trafford before the match and kind of took, con- took control of the stadium. They also convened outside of Man United's hotel, hotel and wouldn't let the team leave. Yeah. So there was also that. Uh, the referee for that match couldn't even get into the stadium. They had He had to be turned away by security and say, hey, it's, not, it's genuinely not safe for you to be here. You need to go. But uh, for Man United fans, like this protest, I feel has been a long time coming. I think the Super League just brought this boiling point just to a head, because United fans have been at loggerheads with their ownership for years. Between like using a leverage buyout to basically like saddle the club with debt just to finance their own purchase of the team. To uh, making like questionable decisions at management level, that's had a knock-on effect of the clubs not supporting, not supporting the managers by giving them the finance that they need to bring in top players, not improving facilities, not maintaining the stadium very well, and just really just cutting financial corners here and there, and not looking after the fans in Manchester, and then she instead. Uh, chasing the almighty dollar elsewhere in the world and trying to trying to uh, play happy families with foreign fans more, more so than people like right on their doorstep and that definitely showed this weekend whenever that ha- when that happened because you know it was obviously it's not going to be it's not going to be tourism fans or day tripping fans that are making that sort of protest it's fans within Manchester it's people who's like their their homes their livelihoods are based in and around this club and it would be a shame if something like that drastic happened to them yeah uh, at, at the end of the day you know these 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 guys these rich owners that uh tried to uh, uh fly this kite you know they think that uh football is just like a a business deal. They think that that they don't understand the uh, 
I mean, the Premiership is what it is, you know, but as a Man United fan, you know, you look at someone like Rashford who came from the, uh, is it the under 21s or under 19s? Which would it have been? Um, Probably the under 19s. Yeah, but he's a, he's a Manchester born uh, person, came in, uh, scored goals against Arsenal, uh, saved them in a, I believe it was Europa League game, you know. That's real football at the end of the day. As much as uh, you know, you can whinge about uh, all the money that people are making. It's obscene and stuff. You know, that's real football. That's why people. Uh, that's the sort of stuff that people get behind. You can't just pretend pretend that the people that follow this are just going to go in line because you've got big money. So it doesn't matter how rich they are. Doesn't matter how much they thought they had this ready to go when it was finalized. Um, my question to you is, uh, people say that this isn't the end of it, that they're going to come back. Uh, do you have any understanding of how, in the name of God, they could try to send sell this again after most of the clubs have uh, apologized their fans? Oh, is it? Do you think it's possible that this could be happen again? And how is that even remotely possible? I don't think it's. I don't think it's likely. Likely in like the immediate future. I do mm-hmm. think this will come up again in due course, but definitely not anytime soon. It came out yesterday from the time that we were recording this that uh, uh, the nine teams that have renounced the Super League and have apologized and withdrawn their interest from it. Uh, they will be making a donation to UEFA based charities and will also be penalised 5% of the revenues that they would receive from UEFA based competitions. So like so like their Champions League incomes or their Europa League incomes would ha- would take a 5% cut as a as a punishment from this. Now you might be looking at that and saying like well, how are they going to get cut? How are they going to get cut at Liverpool? Liverpool aren't even going to be qualifying for the Champions League this year, but it will be out of like the next time that they qualify. Based like the like the punishment will apply then, rather than just the following calendar year. Now they have said that, for in the case of like I said, Juventus, uh, Real Madrid, and Barcelona, who haven't come out here yet they have said that there will be further punishment for them so they could possibly be looking at expulsion from the UEFA Champions League for at least one season perhaps stretching the two but uh, they're gonna have convene uh, at UEFA at the end of the season after this year's Champions League final and decide what to do with them if they haven't if they haven't come out and put this whole thing to bed by then there's another clause in the punishment that they got that if if they breach UEFA commitments and try and uh, set up an unsanctioned league again that uh, they will be fined 100 million euros. Okay. Uh, with immediate effect should should this happen again which I don't think is nearly high enough. It really isn't. <laughs> to be honest with you, because these owners are billionaires. Like this is pocket change to them. Like, like we've had like you're pay- talking to owners who think that you know signing Kylian Mbappe for a hundred and twenty million euros is nothing. That he's that he's so important that he's worth every penny of that. Like. Like what are you gonna do? Like, pay the fine that's the equivalent of one play, one star player to them, and then just let them move on. Like, like that's chump change to these owners. Like that's not really a punishment. There's a really good there's a really good quote that I, I, I posted it like completely on a, on totally unrelated different context to this, but uh, it goes a little something like I might be paraphrasing here, but like if. If your punishment is, if your punishment to a crime is a fine, then it's only really a crime. For, it's only really a crime for the lower class. The upper class can get away with it, and you're yeah. definitely going to see that. Like if they, pull, if they turn around and try and do this like five years from now, like a hundred million, like that's barely a new player to some of these teams. 
And, like, that's nothing. They can, they can, like, one of the top six Premier League sides that were in this, they'll make that back in TV rights in less than a season, easily. It's true, it's true. So, um, it's not really a deterrent. I, 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 I think that's true. I, I, you know, you've, 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 you've got to make a, uh, you've got to make a stance on this to, to really scare them from doing it again. And as you say, the things they've done have really aren't going to, they're not going to put fear into any of these people. I don't um, think so. And you can, you can definitely tell that like, the teams that signed up for this have have all have heavy American influence, like. Man United, American owners. Liverpool, American owners. Juventus have a pretty sizable American presence. It's still, it's still Italian-owned, but have a sizable American presence. Real Madrid and Barcelona have American investors. They're not American-owned, but they have American investors. Spurs, pretty similar. Arsenal, American owners. Like... And you look at their leagues and the way that they're set up over over in America where it's franchise teams and there's no promotion or relegation from their leagues for the most part. And that's what they were looking to do is they were looking to set in, set in this lockdown competition where their so-called idea of the best teams face each other all the time every season and it's guaranteed. And people are going to tune into that but the thing that they're that they're missing the mark on here is that top level top level teams like this meeting in the Champions League is a spectacle because it doesn't happen every season. Like Liverpool don't get to play Atletico Madrid every year, and it's always a, a well maybe not last year because Atletico beat us in was it the quarterfinals last year of the Champions League, but you know it's. Generally speaking, it's usually it's usually a very hotly contested affair when either of these teams meet each other in Europe. But if they're playing each other week in week out, they're playing each other every se- twice a season, every season. The allure of those matches and how special they feel is just going to go away. It's not going to feel the same, and then it's just going to be like watching any other league in the world. Like, sure, you have that whole. My, uh, mantra of like iron sharpens iron and the best will only get better by facing the best but where does that leave everyone else like the Leicester Cities the Leeds Uniteds the Napolis the Romas the Villarreals of the world they're not going to get better because they're because they're not facing the best teams. Like, sure, they'll be the ones who get to replace them in the, champion, in the Champions League because they've gone and they're starting to do their own thing. So, naturally, if they get expelled from their own domestic leagues, then, you know, other teams obviously have to step up and take their places in the sanctioned UEFA competitions. And maybe that would help develop domestic leagues a bit better, but I think it would still be a detriment if it happened, I'm really glad that this isn't going ahead. But I will, I will say that you know, my patience as a Liverpool supporter has definitely been tested over the last couple of weeks because of this, and I'm really having like second thoughts about, you know, supporting them as much as I do, and like, maybe maybe thinking of casting a better glance towards like locally owned teams closer to home like you said like we're both we're both Irish we're both fans of the Irish league we both follow the same Irish team and you know I think it's about time maybe it, I started spending more of my energy following them where you know with there's a lot more local it's a lot more I would just it's, say. It's, yeah, it's it's cliched when people say it's real football because it, you know football, all football is real yeah. football. But at the end of the day, you know if you know it that, matters that, to the players because their play yeah. the players are local and it's it is there. And it's local. it's in our own country. It's uh, you know a half an hour uh, up the road from us. You know it, that you know 
everybody in it, I mean, it doesn't matter, it doesn't even have to be just Irish people, English people who've got clubs closer by to them rather than their Premier League, uh, favorite Premier League clubs. If you've got, uh, you know, a Championship, League One, League Two team near to you, you you've got to be supporting those. You've got to put more interest in those. You don't got to, but, you know, you, if I have to, if I have to explain why that is much more meaningful uh, than supporting um, this uh, high-profile um, English or Spanish team, uh, you know, of course you can do both. That's that's what I always say to people. It isn't one or the other, but uh, in terms of, as you say, questioning the meaningfulness or maybe having little doubts about supporting these Premier League teams from now on. Uh, I've had those doubts for a long time, but uh, I think this kind of puts another light on it. Hopefully, maybe this... Uh, it You know, there's probably going to be more of this, but to me, it, I, I do understand your point of uh, uh, maybe reconsidering uh, the amount of effort you put into it. I think I've been waning on that side anyway. I think local... Local football, a, a team that's closer by to me is definitely gotta gotta be the most important thing anyway. Yeah, like like it like people often say like you can't beat the live experience and well, if you have that at your doorstep rather than having to take like a two hour flight or something to go see a game, like like you'd be you'd be foolish to turn that down. Especially in current times, you know when people aren't. Uh, traveling far or leaving their countries um, I think it, it all sort of fits in that you should probably be do, uh, supporting your local team uh, more so than ever yeah I definitely agree with that 100% so unless you want to say anything else on this topic uh, James or JC no I think I think much like much like 9 of the 12 uh, teams in it. I think it's just time to put the Super League talk to bed, and so. maybe we'll re- revisit football next week and uh, figure out what's happening as, as the uh, as the domestic football season start to come to a close uh, all across Europe, and we get to look at the League of Ireland and as it uh, approaches the mid season point. Yeah, and uh, check in with them and see how see how see how things are progressing at home here and the League of Ireland yeah um, well our final topics of the, of the podcast we're going to uh, change now to wrestling um, both of us are uh, big wrestling fans I've been watching since the uh, late 90s WCW WWE WF at that time uh, big TNA fan AEW the mom- at, at the moment is what I'm watching the most of uh, we're going to touch on the topic uh, to finish the podcast uh, about the Chris Jericho falling off the cage at uh, AEW Blood and Guts a few days ago pretty controversial topic people uh, uh, are giving their opinion on it about was the uh, the cage drop uh, a cop out uh, we'll get to that in a, in, a, in, a, in a little while the first topic is a pretty uh uh, pretty interesting. Could be a controversial topic. I, I want everybody in the comments to uh, give their uh, their picks as well. We're, we're gonna me and JC for life. Uh, we are going to uh, give our five versus five AEW versus WWE a Survivor Series match. Uh, fantasy book this match. You know we've had. Uh, in the, invasion, in the invasion angle in the early 2000s, we had uh, WCW and ECW versus WWE. Uh, people have always uh, fantasy booked their top fave WCW versus WWE guys. Uh, th- what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, pick our five favorite, our five best picks for AEW versus our five best picks of WWE. I'll start off with uh, with my picks for uh, AEW. Um, it, 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 this is a tough one. I think JC will be the same as me. Uh, there's lots of different things you got to take into... I mean, we could just blindly pick people and, you know, that be that. But I, I put a little bit of thought into this. Uh, there's so many guys you could pick in AEW. Lots of the high-profile guys like Jericho, uh, Moxley. Uh, you've got Christian Cage now. 
I didn't pick any of those three guys because for me, and I think JC, you, you, you might have a different take on this. For me, those are more seen as WWE guys. They're now in AEW, um, but I still think they're seen as WWE guys. So what I wanted to pick was AEW more so guys. Uh, and I have one uh, wild card that probably won't surprise uh, uh, JC. Um, so again, I'll, I'll do my picks. Uh, not a big fan of this first pick, uh, but he is a poster child, a poster face, a poster guy of AEW. And my first pick is Kenny Omega. I don't particularly like the guy uh, as a as a talent. Um, I think he's a little bit overrated, but he is. At the end of the day, if you're picking at this moment in time, a representation of a AEW star or somebody that is liked by AEW fans and is used on posters and stuff, Kenny Omega would be the first pick. Um, my second pick is Cody Rhodes. He's, uh, I guess he's had an a, a WWE background, but I don't think anybody would say at this moment in time that he's seen as a WWE guy because he, he started this along with all the other people that started the AEW franchise. So that's, a, that's Kenny Omega, that's Cody Rhodes. Um, my next one is Darby Allen. I think he's the most exciting uh, guy in the AEW roster. I think he's terrific. I think he's, at the moment, he's uh, taking in the biggest ratings. Um, I think he's he's a star. He's already a star. And considering I did not know about the guy a year and a half, two years ago, whenever the AEW started, for me to think that uh, is pretty damn cool. My fourth pick is MJF. Um, he's an asshole. He's an arsehole. Or he's an asshole. He's a. It's sometimes quite irritating to listen to, but that guy is definitely going to be a big star in AEW. He, maybe he already is, but he's he, he's a terrific heel. I think he's an arsehole, but I think him and Omega, if there was a war between them and WWE, I think they'd join forces and they'd fight the WWE guys coming in and they'd stand tall for this one match. Um, and the fifth pick, I mean, this is the one I think that JC are going to probably, and other people might uh, throw flack at. Um, my fifth pick is Sting, which I think a lot of people are going to criticize and say, well, Sting isn't wrestling that much anymore. Um, and c would you really put him in a live five-man or ten-man Survivor Series match? I think it's a perfect way if you were going to use Sting in a big match because he wouldn't have to wrestle that much. He'd wrestle, he'd maybe come in near the end of the match, do a stinger splash, Scorpion Death Drop, take out some of the guys. He could he could be very safe to use Sting in this match. And the reason I'd pick him um, is because he, he isn't a WWE guy. He's never, he, he was in WWE and he had a terrible run that WWE messed up. And he is Mr. TNA at the or Mr. TNT at the end of the day. He is the face of WCW, and I think he would fit as a kind of the legend kind of role in this. My only problem with using Sting is that I feel if you use Sting, you need a WWE guy in the opposite uh, side that is similar. And the W at the moment doesn't have Undertaker, because I, I think he's retired, hasn't he? Um, maybe Lesnar, yeah, not sure. Yeah. So that's my five picks. Kenny Omega, Darby Allin, Cody Rhodes... MGF and Sting. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what is your five picks, JC, for uh, your AEW team? I think you got three out of my five picks there, which I think tell, tells you how how close in thinking and how close in mentality we are. The two okay. that I wouldn't have from your from your team. Your first the first things first. You're pro you're right in saying that you know. I would be probably opposed to having Sting be on the team. Okay. I think Sting, Sting would be a great manager for this team because Darby Allen's going to be on the team, so you're going to have Sting involved in this hypothetical match anyway. Right. Like I'm sure, like I'm sure he'll be at ringside, and like there'll be some other like WWE running interference because that's what WWE likes to do in their matches and. I think Sting being out there with Darby would be the great deterrent in preventing that kind of that kind of uh, brawl from happening outside of outside of the match and preventing interference. He could be like the 
enforcer of the situation, if you will. Good point. I I do agree with Darby Allen, like I said like I said when I said like that Sting would be like the enforcer for this. Darby would probably be my number one pick for this team. Just because he's been like like you said before, like I wouldn't have like known him very well outside of AEW before they started. And he's definitely come leaps and bounds. He's improved a lot. He's definitely he's got that he's got that look. He's got that star power. He reminds me of he reminds me of a young Jeff Hardy when he try when, uh, back in back in the old WWE days, uh, after the after the Hardy Boys got split up in one of the WWE drafts and. Both went solo. One stayed on Raw. One got drafted to SmackDown. I think Jeff stayed on Raw, and he really started to come into his own by himself. Like he had that very memorable feud with the Undertaker, and he ended. Uh, he eventually became. He eventually beat Undertaker to become world champion, and I think I see a lot of that young Jeff Hardy in Darby Allen. I think he he's going to have. A extremely breakout rest of the year. He's been absolutely killing it with the TNT title matches, and yeah. his defenses there. The uh, so he's in your team definitely. Darby Allen is my number one pick. Absolutely, okay. without we're a shadow lo- we're, of a doubt. We're locking Darby in for you. Uh, my number one or my number two pick, uh, would probably be Kenny Omega. I've been a fan of his for a while. I really enjoy his matches. He can, if if he has the right story to tell in the ring and is allowed to tell the story in the ring rather than through promos and stuff, I think he can absolutely knock that out of the park if necessary. And in this kind of a five v five situation, you can you can tell a lot of a lot of story with that. Like, like uh, the whole thing of AEW is like the whole thing is like they're offering an alternative and they're kind of offering something that WWE can't and in terms of like offering of slightly more sports oriented stuff because you know they have the ranking systems and so on so it's like kind of a different presentation style to the WWE but also like you have to look at this from the performer standpoint the storyline standpoint is that AEW are offering people the chance to become megastars without without going to the WWE at all and this is where Kenny could tell that great story is that he had a tryout with the WWE and they looked over him and now he's all of a sudden like this conquistador he's going to all these different federations he's he's collecting world titles for fun he's AAA champion in Mexico he's AEW champion He's Impact Champion. He's a TNA Champion as well after they reactivated that title. There's talk that he might show up in New Japan and win that title as well and just exacerbate things even further. And he'll just use this and use his smarmy elite persona and have Don Callis with him to like rub it into WWE's face. It's like say, hey, this is what you could have had working for you but you turned it down and now I'm a megastar and I don't need you and then have the WWE guys come up against that so you know it, it doesn't really create a kind of that kind of traditional you know the way how they how they do invasion angles they have like one one side is extremely obviously the good side and one side is the bad side yeah. I think it it could add a lot of a dynamic layers there and that AEW fans for the most part will love him because he's representing their brand but yeah as I've been saying like you can you can do a lot of like layers with this like a, like AEW fans for the most part will love Kenny Omega because he's representing them because he's representing them against WWE and like that that kind of tribalism faction war is pretty much like the foundation of wrestling since the 90s since even since maybe even the territory days i wasn't even alive for them back then but it probably was a little bit like that 
but also like you'll have the AEW fans who could be against him because he's he's starting to kind of become too big for his own boots and they want WWE to maybe like bring him down a level or two okay and kind of bring him back to like some sort of like crushing reality that like he's not the ultra star that he thinks he is because all of a sudden he might be beatable in this situation so you've so got like you've having got, ha- having him in sorry what? So yeah you, you've got Darby you've got Kenny so that's you've got a baby face you got a heel um, but you but you both agree with me on those two uh, who else you got and my number three pick is probably John Moxley okay so got, so before got... you before you give your reasons uh, I want you to touch on when you give your after you give your reasons do you agree with my point that he's a WWE guy more so and or does that not really matter too much at this point um, so you, you can try and touch on that I, if you want I don't re- I don't really see him as a WWE guy anymore okay and That's I know that I know that, that might be hard to believe because like AEW's only been a thing for like a year and a half now but but there's mu- there's like a much there's a much different dynamic to the John Moxley character than Dean Ambrose ever was. Like Dean Ambrose came across as this kind of goofy guy who found himself fighting out of these situations that he found himself in, rather th- rather than you know Moxley who goes out looking for the fight. You see, I think and, it, it, know, it it's, it's probably a good choice in my opinion. But I don't know your next pick, so I think if you if you pick who I think you're gonna pick uh, and one of your next picks, I, I I think I my point about him being a WWE guy becomes even more of a problem. But do continue. My number f- my number four pick, and this maybe might be might be where this team kind of starts to fall fall apart here in terms of star power right. is. Maybe, uh, maybe Jungle Boy. Like, sure, he, I, I sure had he thought about him, but I, uh, I felt compared to the other guys I had that he, based on AEW TV, he, he was he hasn't got the push yet. I think he deserves a push already, but you can give your opinion though on it. Yeah, like I don't think like I can agree with you there that like he doesn't really have the star power just yet that may command a place in this team but I think like I think a big a big ma- hypothetical match like this like if it were to happen and if he were to p- play a part in it like this could absolutely be like a career defining performance waiting to happen and I think for some for someone like him like this could be like where he sheds kind of some of the fun part of the Jungle Boy character and you know, turns on, turns on the jets and gives you gives you something that, you know, really sticks with you and thinks like, okay, this guy could, I could see this guy as a world champion, either with or without the Jungle Boy persona, whether he goes, whether he just like, sticks with that or whether he abandons the Jungle Boy persona, abandons the Jurassic Express and goes out on his own and takes the re- takes his real Jack Perry name. And you know, advances on from that, and dare I say, evolves. <laughs> so Omega, Darby, Moxley, Jungle Boy, and and my fifth pick is, I I think it's the same as your fifth pick, MJF. Yeah, I think He's he needs to be in it. De- he he does need to be in it. The WWE can you imagine? Can you needs, imagine his like, uh, promos on WWE? Imagine him face to face giving promos, making fun of them. I, I think that'd be gold. I absolutely can, and WWE fans will certainly be looking for a character that is ridiculously easy to hate, and someone who is fun to hate. And MJF has that in space. He's a fantastic promo. He's great on the mic. But he's also really good in the ring as well, and that's that's what you need is you need all rounders for the kind for this kind of Survivor Series match. Like people that can tell a story 
either either verbally like through promos or through ring work and I think you have like a great mix of guys in that five team that can do both of those combined like each one kind of covers each other's weakness you've got lots of different wrestling styles like you've got Kenny who's more of a technical wrestler John Moxley's a brawler Darby Allen who's like the and Jungle Boy who are like the high flyers of the group and MJF oh, oh. who's kind of a kind of a more mad wrestler but he's kind of more like the kind of he's like the guy you'll put the microphone on just like hey you've got you've got five minutes to make this crowd hate you go and he will knock it out of the park every single time and what about the, uh, the, the you know that's what I was thinking when you pick Moxley Chris Jericho your reason for not picking him or did you did you did you wonder about that did, did you think he was ever going to be a choice for me even way more so than Moxley Chris Jericho is definitely a WWE guy still but what do you think on that was he ever a choice or an idea of yours I did put, I did put him on consideration for for more for several moments and I thought like you know he's the first ever AEW champion yeah you can't definitely can't take that away from him he's been he's been in a lot of entertaining segments he's been he's been a great guy for them to have but this kind of match is about kind of creating star power and I think someone with the star power that Jericho already has I don't think this match needs Jericho that's a good point I want to go I back think. to uh, my Sting pick because I think that's one that would uh, would be controversial to some people and I think other people would get what I was getting at um, I, I think um, if it was any other match people would say well Sting isn't if this was if somebody said well we're going to pick Goldberg um, you know for WWE's pick I would go no not because I wouldn't pick Goldberg but because he doesn't wrestle that much he isn't really there that often whereas with Sting he's one of the few at his age even though he doesn't wrestle that much um, I feel like he's going to wrestle in the next couple of weeks probably the next pair of view I think that he, he's there every week he feels like somebody that's actually a part of AEW um, his connections to WCW would be a really interesting counterpoint to go against WWE uh, WWE's sort of uh, history of misusing WCW guys would be interesting his connections to TNT um, and the fact that if somebody goes oh well he, he he couldn't wrestle a live match I think there's there are, there is suggestion that he will be wrestling live match probably big tag matches and I think this is probably the safest tag match or match you could put him in even uh, beyond cinematic matches to put him in there he wouldn't have to wrestle that much and we all know he can do uh, he can move around and, and do some really cool moves uh, and, and pull off um, a, a short segment that would add to it so I think I think there is a a good a good reason to pick him but I do understand your point that Maybe it doesn't need him, and especially if you pick Jericho or Moxley. My point is, I think you need star quality. That if somebody who's a WWE guy looks at the other team and goes, "Oh well, well, who do they have?" Or if a, if somebody's tuning in the, to this cold and uh, doesn't know much about WWE or W or AEW at the current day stuff, they can go, "Well, I know who Sting is, or I know who Jericho is, or I know who Moxley is." So I think. You gotta have Moxley, Jericho, or Sting. Those are the three biggest uh, stars in terms of name credibility. That if you ask some guy in the street, they're gonna know who Sting or Jericho is. Um, and I think you need one of those because I think that is the problem with the AEW roster that the bigger stars are quite, even at this moment, are still people that um, the vast majority of the public may not know based on name obviously the wrestling community is going to know who Omega and MGF and guys that like that are but I don't think when you compare it to maybe some of the WWE names are going to name out that they're going to have the star quality so do you th would you agree with that that this AEW team 
does need somebody like Sting, Jericho, or Moxley for name credibility. I I do see your point, and I think you are right. Like maybe that maybe that is also like a big factor as to why I pick Moxley, but I can see your point as to like why why you could make a case for Sting or Jericho being in this match, and I'll say as well to add to that like. If you had like someone on the WWE side who was coming into this match, like kind of like how kind of like how I picked Jungle Boy and like have them have it like being their like career defining breakout performance, like you could have that on the WWE side and like you could build someone off the back of he's the person who pinned who pinned Sting in the Invasion Survivor Series match, yeah, like. Like that's like that's a star making performance. Kinda like kinda like kinda like uh Randy Orton when he had the whole legend killer gimmick. Like it's like oh well, he came out and he beat all of these legends like in a, like by almost back to back to back to back to back in a row. And he and he got his like legend killer persona off off of that and that's what turned him into a star. Like similarly, like if you have like someone who's like in the mid car but just can't reach that next level give them the whole I beat Sting and won the match for team WWE and that that's and that's a ball that's going to get run far into the end zone that's going to be a touchdown yeah seven days a week that for me is a I I think I, I give all the credit in the world to Derby, but I I think the addition of Sting with him has really sort of added a kind of turbo boost to his push, getting the push because um, I mean people can criticize the Sting, the use of Sting in AEW that you know he's maybe some of the segments didn't need to happen every week that maybe they're overusing him, but I think the visual of Sting and have him having him. Uh, help uh, Darby out and having Darby sometimes come out and help Sting it's like you know it, it is a really cool way because everybody knows that Sting is there to help out younger guys he's not going to be a pain in the ass like a, somebody like Hogan or Warrior who's going to be politicking and being a really negative uh, person to have around um, so yeah, I, I I think I think he is vital. And again, I'm I'm a big fan of Sting, so maybe that's the reason I'm I'm having him, having him in there more so than maybe a Jericho or a Moxley. Um, so my picks: Omega, Darby, Cody, Sting, and MJF. Uh, I'm going to go into my picks with WWE now. Um, I said this is a been tougher because I don't watch a lot of WWE. Uh, I I very rarely watch it these days. Um, but my picks. Are Roman Reigns because he's one of the biggest stars in WWE at the moment. He's, I think he's got to be in there. Uh, my next pick is Seth Rollins. Uh, another one is Randy Orton. AJ Styles, and then the last pick. Uh, had the Undertaker still been doing matches, uh, the fact that you Sting, I think I would have wanted to have somebody. That fit it in similarly because if you have Undertaker, then AEW picking Sting would obviously have connections and have possibilities the two of them could face each other. Obviously, that's going to add a little thing, a massive thing to the match. And because Undertaker is a WWE legend, but the fact that he's not wrestling anymore, um, uh, you know, made me uh, that that's a, a probably a flaw in my picks. Uh, so my last pick, I, I believe I haven't said it yet, is uh, Daniel Bryan. But then, as I stand here and say that, he isn't under contract anymore. But I feel like he, they're going to uh, probably fix that soon enough. So my picks are Roman Reigns, AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan, Randy Orton, and Seth Rollins. Uh, as, I, as I said, um, there are probably better picks I could pick. But I'm not a big WWE watcher. Um, I think those guys are probably the five most respected and known wrestlers in WWE at the moment. Do you agree with those picks, JC? Or, 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 or how many of those picks are going to be in yours? Honestly, I think I think you've I think you picked my team for me. Right. To be honest. Uh, Roman Re Roman Reigns would absolutely be a slam dunk number one pick. Cuz, you know, he is 
he has come on leaps and bounds since you know embracing this whole tribal chief head of the table uh, persona since he like, turned heel and he is absolutely killing it in that role it, they needed to pull the pen pull the trigger on that years ago but you know what they say that they say that the best th- best time to do it was was then the, the second best time to do it is now then I'm glad that they're doing it now because you know he's a he's just a great, a great bad guy and you watch and you root for him to get beat and he is doing that job incredibly well and the fact that they haven't had him take a, take a lose yet since uh, since uh, adopting that side of his character is really telling like how career defining it is for him my second pick I absolutely agree with you is Seth Rollins he did have a little bit of a blip in quality on the over like the last two years he hasn't been hitting those highs that he had like coming off the back of uh, both his wins against Brock Lesnar like he had that legendary money in the bank cash in at Wrestlemania you had the singles match win against Wrestlemania where he beat him for beat him one on one for the title afterwards so he became the beast slayer but he's kind of he's kind of fallen back and away from the title picture lately but there's there's still there's still enough there that you know that if he wanted to go for the title he could be absolutely be a realistic contender for it and that would definitely play, earn him a place on my team absolutely Number three pick, uh, this is where the team starts to fall apart because, you know, there's not, I don't really feel like there's that much star power in WWE anymore. That you know, There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of people that, you know, you can look at and say, hey, uh, these guys are like undeniably like top best of the best level talent. My number three, no, my, my number three pick is much like much like your Randy Orton pick is uh, turning to that veteran uh, power and I am going to pick Jeff Hardy as my number three pick okay so re- re- recap those again you've got uh, I've got J- Roman Jeff- at number one I've got Seth at number two and now I've got Jeff Hardy as number three okay well, that's a good pick actually because he's a yeah, that's actually a very good pick. I, I probably if I'd seen it, if I'd have if I'd have thought of him, I, I completely <laughs> blanked on him. That's a good pick. I mean, I mean, not to disparage the rest of your picks. Like I did, ser- I did seriously think about having Randy Orton on this team. I probably, I probably still will. He may, he will probably still be pick number four or five. But you know, Jeff Hardy has that veteran presence. He's been wrestling since the early nineties. He's been with WWE in one capacity or another since 1995 would you believe wow like here like like he used to wrestle Scott Hall and Kevin Nash in squash matches on Raw in the, in the early to mid 90s like that tells you how long he's been around yeah he really is a and WWE guy 100% and I think that you know if you got if like Maybe it's a bit too early to be booking that kind of dream fantasy match between him and Darby Allen, but you could definitely have a good five six minute, six minute spot fest against each other after like after like a double hot tag and both of them you know hit their spots and get their stuff in on each other. That could like, be an, in, in that, a, yeah, like that would a be really, really good quick fire. And and not to like, n- not to keep going back to it, but you've. We both picked Seth Rollins. Can you imagine if Seth Rollins and Sting were in the ring again? That would be really heated because we know how that ended. Oh that, boy, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Sting would want uh, would want to give him a receipt for that buckle bomb. That uh, no more buckle bombs. <laughs> no more buckle bombs. Um, sorry, I interrupted you there. Keep going. <laughs> But yeah, my number three pick is Jeff Hardy. My number four pick, I'm going to agree with you there, is Randy Orton. 
again, okay. like for from the AEW side, like someone getting a win, getting a win, and eliminating Randy Orton from the from the match is an absolute star making moment waiting to happen. And I think that that would be a big feather in the cap for anyone who is able to pull that off. Maybe Randy might even be the last person standing just because, you know, he is the apex predator. He's the the smartest ring technician there is out there. Like, he knows how to, he knows how to, like, stay unhurt. He knows how to, like, stay out of a match and just make an instant impact as soon as he comes in. And he could just, he could absolutely be that impact player you're looking for when you have like only one or two people remaining in your team. Like he's the person who you have like that you know he can deliver the goods for your team. So from yeah. a WWE standpoint, you'd be foolish and your to final not pick, pick for that. Hello. My final pick, this might be a little, uh, this is kind of a little bit tricky, but I think I would go for, for, I mean, we're sticking with current day WWE, but I think my fifth pick would probably go to Kevin Owens. Oh. I've been a fan of his for quite a while now. So He's, no Daniel Bryan or AJ Styles? Interesting. Honestly speaking, I would see AJ Styles as still an impact wrestling guy. Okay. Like he like he like he, he's had a great WWE career since he since he moved across, don't get me wrong. But I think if you're kind of booking this kind of a dream, that's kind of a dream match, you know, you could have like you could have the like the Survivor Series match be like the like end of an invasion angle. But of course, then what's going to happen when one invasion angle ends, another one begins, and who do you think is going to lead Team Impact in that invasion? <laughs> Only Mister TNA himself, the phenomenal one, AJ Styles, <laughs> defect defecting back. So he's pulling a Stone Cold uh, and turned on WWE. That uh, that's the. And he's joining. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't say he's turning more so than he's just going home. He's to going where home. He, where yeah. he, where he belongs as the top guy in a in a company where he finally uh, will be recognized as the top guy that he is, rather than being constantly overlooked, <laughs> like okay. like he was like for a lot of the t- a lot of that early TNA stint where they you know they, they just wouldn't pull the trigger on him. So Kevin Owens, what your your reasons for him uh, trying to add an asshole like MJF into the WWE uh, production? A bit of that as well, yeah. Like he, like Kevin Owens is a great promo. He, like, is like a super likable person outside of the ring. Don't get me wrong. I think like that kind of plays into a little bit as well. You want him to like have that one big match to to point at and say like hey this this is like the greatest moment of your career be proud of it but also like he can he can turn it on and make you hate you if he wanted to and he is really good at doing that but like you can you can you can almost even take him taking sides out of it like you remember like i don't know if you remember like the early days of of Kevin Owens when he came in and he had that that prize fighter gimmick where he was just like he's just like in wrestling purely for the money he's just in it for the payday to, to like look after his family and that's it like he has no other motivations he has no allegiances only to just get paid okay like you can have him in that and just, as just like I want to get paid and I'm in this match but you know whose side am I on like Tony Khan might be offering a, a bit of extra money to turn on team WWE and <laughs> lean and lean into that a little bit as a little bit of a kind of a will he won't he turn like will he will he finally learn what loyalty is or will his only loyalty be to the almighty dollar 
Whether the US or where the US or Canadian dollar. We'll leave that up to him to decide. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna finalize our teams here. Um Mine's is gonna be Omega, Darby, Cody, MJF, Sting, uh and my pick for WWE is gonna be Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, and you know, I might I might just change styles to Jeff Hardy. I might go along with yours because I think I think Jeff Hardy's a good pick, so yeah, I'll add Jeff Hardy as my fifth. And your 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 finalized teams are And my finalized teams on AEW was John Moxley, Darby Allen, Jungle Boy Oh my goodness, I can't even remember who I picked. <laughs> Uh, John Moxley, Darby Allen, Jungle Boy, MJF, MJF, and freaking hell, who was? I can't even. This is embarrassing. I can't even remember. Um, <laughs> Look at the memory of a goldfish here. Oh Lord! Um, name them again: Mega, Darby, MJF. Omega, Darby, Moxley, Jungle Boy, and MJF. Yeah, that's the five. That's the five. And your WEs? Against, is... against Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, uh, Kevin Owens, Jeff Hardy, and... Freaking hell. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening again. And Randy Orton. <laughs> and Randy Orton. And Randy Orton. Those are damn yeah, cool picks. I, I, I think I, 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 I think it'd be epic either way. I, I want people in the comments to... Uh, Leave their five picks of each um, and comment on what you th who who got the closer uh, JC or Final Flame. Uh, at the end of this podcast, we're gonna just uh, quickly uh, give our thoughts on the uh, Chris Jericho cage bump from uh, Blood and Guts. Uh, it got a the match itself. People seem to really like, um, but again, much like the uh, the uh, fart of a. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the uh, fireworks uh, or, or the the yeah. uh, captions enclosed barbed wire death match. Yeah, that complete fiasco it sort of reared <laughs> itself in a slightly less uh, controversial, but but still quite controversial. Uh, Chris Jargo was thrown off the top of the cage by uh, MJF, uh, and he landed uh, on the stage. He went through it. But the problem a lot of people have is that it looked like he fell into a, uh, uh, a whole big a big box of mattresses, and he just it looked really comfy. It looked like somebody just fell back in their bed, like a lot of people have said. Um, for me, before I let JC get in on this, I thought it was a. I think if you're going to go to the top of a cage, somebody's got to go off it. Now I'm of the opinion that. To do a cage drop well, um, the, the the landing is the is the controversial part. I mean, the the best landing of a cage, or sorry, not the best, but the most uh, the most impactful and the most memorable one is uh, when Mankind was thrown off the Hell in a Cell by Undertaker. Uh, the only problem with that is that while it looked great, the problem is that it really the reason it looked great is because it was dangerous as hell. Uh, and it could have it could have killed uh, Mick Foley and mankind, so it's great and all uh, that. I mean that's a memorable thing, and Mick Foley walked out of it um, just barely. But you cannot do that anymore. It's you should not be doing that because as much as it looked uh, epic and it's the most memorable, one of the most memorable things in wrestling history, uh, it could have killed the guy. Uh, the problem is, if you do it safely, the way you've got to do it safely, uh, uh, it's going to look like something like the Chris Jericho thing, or it's going to look uh, like the Chris Canyon uh, getting thrown off by Mike Awesome at the Triple Gage, where you just feel like they're falling on something really comfy, and it completely takes away the point of doing a cage drop. Uh, I go back to, I've, I've been tweeting out my Final Flame page, uh, that the best example of doing this safely uh, is Shane McMahon at Backlash? I think Shane McMahon did it, did something else at it when he, he well anyway the Backlash example was Shane McMahon 
uh, doing an elbow drop off the top and take a throne, which was much higher. Uh, so, you yeah. know, that, that was made... that last man standing match against the big show, wasn't it, right? It was. Uh, and yeah. he, again, he, he landed on a crash mat. Uh, the, the, the key difference is that they added uh, what I believe is some sort of really light wood or some sort of aero board. I don't know the right uh, material they used. But when he landed on the big show, this wood or aeroboard or whatever it was just exploded and you read there was an impact there was a sound there was a there wasn't somebody falling on a mattress and i think that's i mean this this is extremely nitpicky and it's it's extremely first world problems I and mean, with all going on in the world for people to be really nitpicking this stuff is a little bit silly but i mean it's fun at the end of the day for wrestling fans to talk about this stuff and again, I mean, it was a big thing. I mean, if you're going to end uh, a show that done really big rating, I believe, uh, and you end it on a really kind of uh, lump note, uh, it is a, it is a production thing. It is a, a bit like the barbed wire death match. Uh, it does take away from a big uh, match. It does take a memorable match and make it a little bit of a, uh, a, a sour taste at the end of it. But what's your opinion? Do you agree that the bump looks looked a little bit disappointing? And do you think that uh, it's possible to make it look better? Or do you think it's simply you got to kill the guy if you want to make it look good? I think it could have looked a lot better. But I I don't think that... Uh, you, brought, you brought up the... Shane McMahon elbow drop on Big Show from the top of the backlash Titan Tron and I like that was that was incredibly well done but even then they don't need to they don't need to do that. Like production clearly would have known about this spot coming up. They would have like sure like we want to we want to say that everything happens in the heat of the moment because we want to suspend our disbelief. That's what wrestling's all about. But you know they they practice these spots to make sure that they're safe and to make sure that you know they can do them when it comes to performing them in front of a live audience and production should have known that this was going to come like you want you want to show this in a in a manner that shows that Jericho is incredibly hurt but also don't want to show him being super super safe have the camera point up from the floor to the top of the cage. Have them show Jericho coming down. Don't have them showing him landing. That's all you had to do. Was just don't show Jericho after he landed. That's have it be like yeah. the cliffhanger going from one week into the next. Is, is Chris Jericho okay? We literally have not seen him since he hit the ground. I, I think... And that's I, all you I, have to do there. I think it's a controversial... You don't have to go and... I think possibly Sorry. what you brought up there is could possibly be more controversial, which I think that you may not have realized because I think if people could be saying if that was what they did, that they copped out, that they didn't show uh, the impact and that the people would be shortchanged, do you think that that's a possibility? That if you don't show the drop, that you've maybe taken the shortcut out and that people will be pissed off even maybe more so? Honestly, I prefer i I would prefer the co I would prefer the cop out than it to look look te like terrible. See, see, for me, it's it, it's not any. I mean, they've done this match live. Uh, I believe it was live, wasn't it? It wasn't a taped. It, it was live. Yes, it was. Yeah. It was in, a in front of a live audience. It was not pre-recorded. And, and and they had an audience there, so that there was no way of. Uh, of getting around this like if it was a cinematic match or if it was a tape match they could have got around it they could have uh, you know any number of ways they could have uh, fixed it uh, for me yeah. it, it just comes down to simple things like the the, 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 the Shane McMahon drop the reason why that uh, works more so and it and it, and, it, and for me it, it looked and it felt really safe maybe the height he did it from was way too high I mean it's an insane height that he jumped from uh, it's just you, you, you. It's like a table break. I've never fallen through one of those tables, uh, 
but I, I'd imagine if you put pillows and mattresses under one of those tables, it wouldn't be that sore if you landed on it fine. So, you know, uh, of course, if you fell through a table and onto the concrete, it's not going to be that nice. Uh, but I think you needed something for him to fall through, even if he fell through something and he went down deeper that you couldn't see him. But he sort of landed and it just landed like he was just laying there sleeping on a bed. It just and the metal grating things, which weren't metal, they were like plastic or something. Yes, oh, that's, that's, that, that was that's what compounds things and makes things even worse. That's why I brought up the you know the camera angle, yeah. and just don't and just don't show him after he landed because if that if you're going to insist on showing him after he's fallen, you don't want to see that. Like that just looks terrible. Like you could just not show that, just slate of hand the whole thing. I think an announcer table um, being there could, uh, it wasn't the right side for there to be an announcer table there, but uh, an announcer table is a pretty nice way of him breaking through something, but then having something under it. Um, I just, I think there's a lot of ways you could have fixed it. I, uh, it's one of those things though, if you commit to doing a kid drop, uh, you know, you've got to do it safe. That, I mean, you agree, you obviously agree with me that the yeah. man, the man kind yeah, thing, yeah. the man kind thing looked awesome. But there's a reason why it looked awesome because it was fucking real, and they could have killed yeah. him. Yeah, uh, and nobody as I much mean, as it, people. I mean, it, it was probably it was probably rehearsed a lot beforehand, but you know, like they figured out a way to do it that was safe, and of course, and then there was the whole matter of, well, we haven't really we haven't seen this spot before, so like, yeah. we we never expected this to happen, whereas now with cage matches, you're like. Well, when is someone going to dive off the top of the cage? When are someone going to get thrown off the cage? Like, when was the last time you saw a cage match where nobody interacted with the cage and they just had a straight up wrestling match and just in, and it just so happened to be inside of a cage? No. Like you haven't. Like sometimes you just gotta subvert expectations, and maybe this was one of those times where they should have done that. Sure, they had like the great kind of blow off to the to the whole pinnacle versus inner circle mjf versus jericho feud here where you know he gets tossed off the off the top of the cage but you know what else would have would have been a suitable a suitable ending to the feud mjf just beating jericho clean in the middle of the ring and have that as your handing of the torch moments like mjf is like well i'm the chief asshole around here now good luck with that and that's it that's if you tell the story right, that's all you need to do is just have a wrestling match. You don't need to go to these extreme lengths and put your body in danger and open yourself up to criticism from poor production quality and, you know, make things even more complicated than they have to be. I, You know, and I think at the end of the day, the, prob the problem with the entire show was that with, with people saying that, well, they did it safe, uh, AEW is really, really uh, stand up and great. Uh, that that might be that might uh, sell uh, if we hadn't seen uh, about forty minutes before this, or a little bit more than that. Uh, Darby Allen getting thrown down uh, concrete steps. Uh, you know, <laughs> like that was probably the most shocking thing I've seen in wrestling in a long time. So. The fact that they went through all this bother to protect uh, Chris Jericho, which they should have, uh, and then Tony Khan, Tony Khan is allowing Darby Allen to throw himself down concrete steps. Um, it's 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 a big contradiction of uh, of their of their mindsets, and I, I I mean I love Darby Allen. I think his death defying moves are awesome, but. He cannot be doing that stuff because he is not going to be around wrestling in the, in the next 10 years, let alone 20 years. So, um, you know, I, I, did you see that bump, the the step bump? I, I did, yes. I, I saw highlights of it, yeah, and it looked nasty. You know, that's something like, that you, you've <laughs> got to you've got to do uh, pre-tape it and do it from multiple camera angles and try to make it as safe as possible, if that's even possible. I don't think it is. Um, I don't think it's safe as possible. I just, I just think Darby is just nuts enough to want to do to want to do that by him, to himself or by himself. 
but you know, Chris, That's, Chris you know, Jericho, he, <laughs> Chris, okay. Chris, you know, yeah, Chris Jericho wasn't going to fall off there unless it was going to be safe, and that's and that's damn smart of him because nobody should. But t Tony Khan, uh, Cody Rhodes, whoever is going to be uh, green lighting or shutting down things, has to tell Darby Allen that he can't be doing this because uh, if he wants to drop through a table, uh, Swanton in outside, okay, but jumping down concrete steps or. Uh, uh, I forget what else he's done that's been uh, insane. There's been so much of it. But they've Being got to stop. dragged from the back of a car down a desert road? Uh, well, that well, was... While in a body bag? <laughs> that's questionable. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, th that's a side thing, but I, I think those guys are going to take more responsibility because, uh, you know, they've got a star there and they don't want him to get hurt and they don't want to... They want to prolong his career, and he should. If he isn't smart enough, uh, the guys who are in charge need to be. Um, so, unless you want to say anything else, I, I think we're going to wrap this up. No, I think I think that's uh, that's a very good place to uh, to close it out here. Well, this has been our first podcast, uh, the final final flame podcast. Uh, uh, I've got to say thanks to JC for a live. Uh, th what's the full name of your YouTube channel? Y YouTube channel, James. The full name of the YouTube channel is just JC for Life. Yes, that's JC correct. for Life. I'll leave a, so a link link in the uh, comment section, but or sorry, the, the uh, description of the video. Uh, please do check him out. He's a really cool streamer, uh, and we 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 hope to have more uh, podcasts coming up soon. Uh, but if you want us to discuss things, ask put your questions in the comment section and. Uh, uh, we will try to discuss as much of the content you want us to talk about uh, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but again, I've been Final Flame Productions, and we I've been uh, joined by JC for Life. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks.